So we're going to start. We're going to start a new study. We finished Malachi last week, and the new title of this lesson is called "Mighty Through God," and it's a topical lesson. It's not a book study line by line we, like we've done recently. Um, and the first lesson is taken from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. So you've had a lot of time to get there, so get to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And what I was going to read you on my phone, which I don't know where my phone is, but um, I, got a, I got a text message this morning. Like, I don't know if any of you people go on, you know, like, online stores you know and then when you buy something from an online store they you know to buy it you got to sign up for, on the email list so then you get like nine million junk emails a month from these people but i didn't think it was funny this morning i got a text message from a place called lehman's in ohio which sells like amish stuff and every now and then they'll give this little you know you know feel good little reminder and this morning's I thought was interesting was Ohio State University professors come out with a new study that if you do kind things for other people, it helps you with your depression and anxiety and everything else. And I'm thinking to myself, well, duh. <laughs> <laughs> All you had to do was read the book, <laughs> not spend, what, $3 million on some study by two professors in Ohio State University to tell you that. It's like, are you kidding me? Uh, I just thought that was comical. It's like, I, you know, I could have saved them a lot of effort. Uh, simple. But this morning, if I were to ask you, if, what would a key be to Christian living, you might say things like obedience, or holy living, or praying, or reading the word, or you, you come up with a whole bunch of good things that are keys to Christian living. But this morning, I'd like to look at one little section of the word which is being transformed by the renewing of your mind and that's kind of the lesson in that little nutshell is being transformed by the renewing of your mind now when I look out among this group I would say for the most part most of you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior I'm going to qualify everything that I say this morning. The whole lesson is geared to people that have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior. If you have not put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you cannot do the things I'm going to tell you you, you need to do this morning. You have to... You have to be a saved individual. You have to have the Holy Spirit leading and guiding you and help you un in understanding the Word of God and putting on these physical and spiritual attributes in your life. It, it's a spiritual thing. It's not a, you know, I'm going to be Michael Jordan if I dribble enough. No, you're not, most likely. Well, you can say, well, I'm, I'm going to be a Christian, and I, I'm going to do all these things. I'm going to act like a Christian, talk like a Christian, do all these things. You're, you're not going to be a Christian until you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. I don't know if that was a good analogy or not, but it's what came to my mind. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 
There's three actions in that those two verses that we need to do to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And the first thing that we see in that those two verses is we need to present our bodies a living sacrifice. And if you were here for the Malachi study, you remember that in Malachi, the Lord was uh, condemning them for the sacrifices they, that they were bringing. The sacrifices that they were bringing were not according to God's commandments. He had specific commandments on how that sacrifice was to be handled and sacrificed. And they were not doing it. They got condemned in the book of Malachi for that. Well, we come into the New Testament, and now we have... I, you look at it. We're doing things a different way. I want a living sacrifice. That's us on the altar. Living sacrifice. And we need to keep in mind that God has specific commandments and expectations for that living sacrifice. And the same connotation applies to what applied to Malachi. I need to be a living sacrifice. That means I don't come to God maimed, broken, doing things my own way, completely, Malachi said what? Profaning the holiness of God, profaning His commandments, and then expect God to accept my worship, accept my sacrifice. God wants a living sacrifice. So that, that's not the lesson this morning, but... Um, that's number one. The verse that comes to my mind when I, when I think about that verse, present your body as a living sacrifice, always is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. For ye are bought with a price. Verse, end of verse 19 says, and ye are not your own. Verse 20, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We are not our own. Jesus Christ paid our penalty on the cross of Calvary for us. He took our sins. He bore our sins. We owe him such a debt of gratitude of love. Whenever I am going to live as a living sacrifice, I keep that in my mind and I say, I'm not my own. I've been purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore, I'm going to glorify God in my body. Why? Because I love Him. Because He loves me so much that He came to earth, incarnation, born, lived, died, buried, resurrected, and makes intercession for me in heaven. And one day, I will be with Him in glory. It's going to be amazing. So I always tie those two verses together in my mind. The second thing we see in those verses are and be not conformed to this world. And that again isn't the lesson this morning. And you've probably heard a thousand messages on that. But I, I would simply put it like this. You're all, most of you all in this room are of the age that when you were a kid you probably got a tube of Play-Doh with the, you know, the little flat little long thing that has all the shapes in it and you put it in the little squeezer downer thing right and when you put the play-doh in there and you push the squeezer downer thing it comes out whatever shape is in front of the shape the thing they've changed that now they it's a garbage truck but anyway um you learn all the stuff when you have grandkids but 
When I think of that, be not conformed to this world, I think about the world is constantly trying to get me into that Play-Doh pusher downer thing. And it's constantly putting the squeeze on me to get me out that mold that it wants me to look like. And I gotta reject it. Be not conformed. Resist being squeezed into their mold is how I think about it. But number three is where we're gonna spend our time this morning is be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Well, what does transformation mean? And it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. And I, I have, I don't know, I don't even know when it was, maybe four or five, six years ago, I did talk about this little section in one of my lessons. You probably all forgot about it, so I forgot to remind you again this morning. Um, the Greek word there, transformed, is metamorpho. And instantly your mind would, I would think, like mine, go to metamorphosis. Which is where we get our word, metamorphosis, from the Greek word metamorpho. And it, it's combining two Greek words, not that it matters to anybody, but meta, to change, morpho, shape or form. So we see metamorphosis in the real life world when we look at a caterpillar, and that would be like the most blatant visualization of metamorphosis. And you know, you learned that in your earth science or biology class many, many years ago. And you probably looked at a you know a monarch butterfly or whatever and what it was and how it entered that crystallis and then it came out that monarch butterfly. There's three other places in the New Testament where that word metamorpho is used, which I think is interesting. Matthew 17, 2 is the passage that talks about the transfiguration. And he was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as light. Matthew 17, 2. That word transfigured is from the Greek word metamorpho. Mark 9, 2, talking about the same event, after six days Jesus talketh, taketh with him Peter, James, and John, and leadeth them up into a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. Same Greek word, metamorpho. And then when you come to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. That word changed is metamorpho. Translated to English, changed. Translated in Matthew and Mark, transfigured. Translated into English in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, transformed. But it's all the same idea and all the same expression. And if, if you read the first part of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it's all, it brings the idea in the first part of that chapter about Moses being exposed to the glory of God. And how when he was exposed to what? The hinder part of God, his glory, when he came down, the people, he had to put a face covering on because his face was so bright from being exposed to the hinder part of God's glory. And that's the whole first part of the verse. And then when we come down to verse, chapter 3, verse 18, it talks about us with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. We, we are exposed to the glory of the Lord when we read and ingrain, engraft the Word of God into our lives. And it should change us. It's, it should metamorphosize us in the same fashion where when we're saved and we read the Word of God, 
and, and we ingrain all the stuff into our lives, there should be an expression of our lives that people see that show them we were exposed to God. We were exposed to His glory. We were exposed to what He wants for us in our lives. And it should be obvious. It's an inward change that is noticed or expressed on the outside. And when you, th and I, I have said this before, but I, I just think it needs repeating. The, the whole butterfly analogy to me is, is almost perfect. And when, when you think about, when, when I think about myself before I was saved, and then I think about the caterpillar before he became a butterfly, it is so similar. And then after I was saved and processed, <laughs> what I am now. For example, the caterpillar crawls on the ground. I mean, it's born on a milkweed, the monarch. Crawls around in not a very big area. Can get stepped on, dusty, Easy pick off for predators. But when that caterpillar becomes a butterfly, it rises above. It flies. Its whole field of vision changes. It's, it, it now migrates thousands of miles through the air. I mean, it's just amazing how it changed. When it was a caterpillar, it ate leaves, it destroyed plants. When it became a butterfly, it drank nectar and pollinated plants, and it was a promotion of plant growth. And, th and the comparison, when you think about it in a spiritual analogy, in my prior unsaved life, I ate plants, I destroyed them. Now that I'm a child of God, I should promote growth. I should help others. Black, white, and yellow striped. Little fat worm thing with a lot of legs. When it comes out the other side, I mean, have you seen a picture of the monarch butterfly? I mean, the colors and the, the dots that are different colors and, the, and like the, the shapes of the black webbing that goes through the wings and everything. It's just, it's amazing. What? Can I? Oh, I thought maybe something wasn't working. I, go ahead, yeah, go ahead. Can I interject something here? About two days after that chrysalis is formed and that caterpillar is inside, if you were to cut that open, you know what you'd find? Liquid. The thing actually turns into a liquid. It's indistinguishable, it's not a caterpillar, it's not a butterfly, it's just a liquid. And yet God yeah. has set all that together. Yeah, that's amazing. It's about a transformation. Yeah. 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 And, and in the spiritual sense, so I don't know if you heard what Jim said, but in that chrysalis, you cut that chrysalis open two days after, it's, it's like becomes mush, liquid. And comes out, God puts that all back together again and brings it out a butterfly on the other side. Try to explain that, Mr. Scientist. God is the explanation. Anyhow, I should be in indistinguishable from my previous unregenerated life. I shouldn't be going back to my old way of doing things that was not pleasing to God. I mean, some things you're still going to do. I mean, I still get up and go to work, okay? I did that before I was saved. You know, certain things you still do, but I'm talking in the spiritual sense. Of course, my view of work did change a little bit after I got saved, but... You know a monarch butterfly eyes change 
It not only soars above with a whole different view of what it saw when it was a caterpillar from you know, this high off the ground. It has 6,000 lenses on its eyes. I mean, it's, it's just amazing. The whole view changes. Your whole view and my whole view changes when the Spirit of God takes up residence in your life. Your whole view changes. And it's a great picture of the old man and the new man. And I'll even take it one step further. You know, once the monarch butterfly caterpillar becomes a butterfly, he can't go back to becoming a caterpillar. Now, these, these sad sacks that say they can lose their salvation, it'd be like the monarch butterfly going back and becoming a caterpillar again. Those are the new Sadducees, I think. But anyway. After I got saved, I was released from sin's bondage. I had a new appetite, a new view, a new look, new actions. I didn't have a desire to go crawl around as I did before. And soon, I will migrate to my heavenly home, which is going to be just amazing. So let's talk about renewing our mind. Renew means to make new again or to renovate. The thought conveyed by that word renew is, is not to make something brand new from nothing. It's the idea of taking something that exists and renewing it, give it a work over, recondition it, something that's old or broken in order to make it far superior to what it was before. So if we're to be transformed into the very image of Christ so that we think like him, we act like him, we must repair our mind and make it far superior to what they were before we were saved. Now you see why I'm saying this can't happen if you're not saved. You, you can't go through the repair process. You can't go through the renewal, renovation process if you're not indwelt by the Holy Spirit, if you're not a child of God, because it's something that He helps you do. He gives you the understanding. He gives you the grace to put these things into your life. He gives you the, the, even the appetite to do them. Therefore, and I, I don't hear a lot of preaching on this. Sometimes I hear a little bit of it, but I, I can't help but think of the battle for a Christian is in the mind. It's in the mind. Because my body does not do things apart from my mind. Put on the helmet of salvation. It'll protect your mind. It'll protect the battleground. You've all been to the grocery store. When I, go, I don't go to the grocery store very often. Renee doesn't like me going to the grocery store because if I go to the grocery store, I like to go up and down every aisle in the store to see if there's something I might like. She wants to get in, grab the things on her list, and get out. She could care less what's in the other aisles. And then as, you know, she relents and she humors me because I don't go that often. She allows me to go through all the aisles and she puts up with it. But what she has noticed when that happens is things end up in the cart that she was not intending on having in the cart. So therefore, she doesn't like me going to the grocery store. <laughs> but when I get to that checkout aisle, 
And it ain't the self-checkout aisle, I'll tell you that, because I would never go grocery shopping if I had to use the self-checkout aisle. I just refuse to do it. It is, it just raises my blood pressure, okay? If you give me a 10% discount to do my own checkout, I'd be happy to go through it, but you're not giving me any discount, you're not employing anybody, and then you want me to do my own work and you're not giving me a discount. It, it makes no sense. Anyhow, when, I, when you go through the regular checkout aisle, you go through the checkout aisle and you're subjected to two, five or six foot long things of what? Impulse buy items, right? Tic Tacs and Snickers bars and I mean you name it, it's in that little impulse buy because they know, they know what's going to happen. If they're slow enough, you're going to grab something off of that aisle. So it's like this. It's the battle of the mind, right? Here's an earthy example of how it works. I go into that aisle. I look from side to side. The first thing is I should have never looked from side to side, right? But I did. And there is a Snickers bar. So then my brain tells my tongue that Snicker bar would be really good. And I start to salivate like my dog. And then I look at it. And then I lust after it. My brain is doing the action though. It's telling my hand to go grab that thing. Put it in the car. It's telling my hand to pull my wallet out and put the money down for that Snickers bar. And when I get in the car, it's telling my hands to open that booger and eat it. It's a battle in the mind. And it, I'm just talking about a Snickers bar. There's a hundred things a day that we go through where that same battle takes place on the spiritual side. But here's the battle. Here's where, here's where it is. And the whole idea of this lesson is we got to have our minds renewed and transformed and we got to take on the mind of Christ and we need to have that battle won here. Because if it wins here, these little things don't do anything. Sally has been in the house this week. Now for Mark and Kathy, Shirley, right? Cheryl. Cheryl. Cheryl with a C. Thought I had it. I, I, I jokingly tell stories about my wife and I have her permission to do this, okay? So don't... But I, I jokingly say, which even though it's a joke, it is kind of true. My wife has three personalities. So I married Renee, right? Steady Freddy. Then there's Sally, who's like really fun to be with, okay? Like there is there is no downer when Sally's in the house, okay? And this is just names I come up with. So if, if you have one of these names, don't it's no problem. Then there's Veronica. Okay, you don't want Veronica. That, mm. So Sally comes home with nutty buddies. And I have a weight problem. Because I have a mind and a tongue and a self-control problem. But then it, I got a new battle, right? It's battling Sally. Because when Veronica's in the house, the Nutty Buddies are hid and Veronica eats them all by herself, okay? But when Sally's in the house at 10.30 at night, she'll say, hey, let's have a party. I got Nutty Buddies, we'll put them over chocolate ice cream and have a party. And I'm like, oh yeah, I mean, come on. But it's a battle, right? A lot of things. Don't let anybody tell you they're not. They are. Overeating is fun. 
But it's terrible for me. In fact, it's, it's expressly prohibited in the Bible. Say that one more time. Exactly. If it was like getting a root canal, we wouldn't do it. Exactly. I have a lot of good Sally stories this morning, but I, it, to me it's a good analogy, okay? My grandkids were over on Friday. Because my oldest son went on a cruise for the first time, then his plane got canceled on the way home and, and to get a hotel and rent a car to get home and all this crazy stuff, so we had to have the kids on Friday. So I'm sitting there, starting on my lesson, everything's going good. I hear out of the corner of my ear, we're going to have a tea party. Tea party. And we're going to have Christmas cookies, I hear, for the tea party. And all of a sudden, my heart sinks. Because I go, ruh -roh. Renee doesn't know that I've been into the Christmas cookies. <laughs> but they've been there since Christmas. This is now Friday. I mean, what, the, the, the middle of February. So it's like, she has this huge box taking up space in the freezer that's like, why? So I, I'm, in my mind, I play this all out in my head. I'll be doing her a favor if I eat those Christmas cookies because she's constantly complaining about having no room in the freezer. So, when she's not looking, I eat Christmas cookies. Trying to do her a favor. Then Friday comes and I hear her say, we're going to have a tea party and we're going to have Christmas cookies. And I'm thinking, there's five grandkids here and there's three Christmas cookies left because I took an inventory. <laughs> So I, I, wait, I brace myself for impact. Tim! <laughs> Grandpa was in the Christmas cookies! <laughs> As she's breaking Christmas cookies apart for the grandkids. You see, but I played all these battles out in my head ahead of time. And I even justified in my mind. I'm going to be doing her a favor by doing this. I'll, I'll, ignore, I'll ignore the fact that my belly is like eight months pregnant, okay? I'll, I'll ignore all that, but I'll be doing her a favor by eating the Christmas cookies, you know? So that's why I'm saying it is a battle of the mind. This transformation and by the renewing of your mind is a battle of the mind. We have an adversary. He continually seeks to attack us through our minds. On the other hand, if we develop the mind of Christ, we will be mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We will have a consistent victory over Satan. Once our minds are remade, reworked, renovated, so that we think like Christ and act like Christ, we will have victory in the Christian life. And that is why Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's how we win the battle, by having the mind of Christ. Well, 2 Corinthians you're only a book away. I have it written in my notes, but you're only a book away. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 to 6. We had this on our refrigerator the whole time our kids were growing up. These three verses. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. 
Paul pictures the mind as a city in which Satan has sieged on the outskirts. And a lot of times we allow him to build towers and strongholds. And when we allow him to do that, next thing you know, our city is broken down without walls. Proverbs 25, 28. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. As Christians, we must use the power of God to throw down these siege towers and fortresses so that Satan cannot have the victory in our lives. Well, what's this? here's the question. What have we allowed Satan to build in our mind that we keep having trouble with? Now, I've already confessed to some of my issues this morning. I have a whole lot more than that, and I'm sure you do too. And a lot of times, we have these strongholds, and it's attack after attack, and weakening after weakening. And next thing you know, we're broken down, munching on the chocolate. The battle is in the mind. Well, how do we renew our minds? By daily meditation in the Word of God. Turn to Psalm 119, 9 through 16. Psalm 119, 9 through 16. The psalm writer asked the question, how can a young man be clean in his life? How can a young man have victory over sin? And he answers his own question in the passage in verse 9, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? I mean, how, how is this going to happen? I mean, and it, it says man there, but I mean, if you're a lady here this morning, it, it applies to you too. How are we going to live a clean life? How, how are we going to cleanse our way? And then he answers it. By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Or by obeying the word. And when you think about it, if we're going to heed the word, we have to know what it says. I can't heed it if I never read it. I can't have a, a cleansing in my life. I can't have a clean life by expecting the only cleansing that I understand from the Word of God is given from an hour from the pastor on Sunday morning. That's 52 times a year. That's 52 verses out of the whole Bible, right? If he uses one verse. I mean, it, it, it's foolish. You got to read the Word of God. You got to meditate on the Word of God. You got to know what it says if you're going to take heed to it. Verse 10, with my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Your whole heart. A lot of times we have, oh, I'll give you 80%, but you know the other 20 is mine. No. You're not going to have victory unless you give God your whole heart. Your whole heart. Thy word have I hidden my heart that I might not sin against thee. By memorizing the word of God. How do you hide God's word in your heart? You memorize it. See, it's more than just reading. I mean, you, you can read the Bible. That's awesome. It's a great thing to do. But you got to take it a step further than that. You got to memorize it. You got to ingrain it. You got to live it. You got to heed it. You got to obey it. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy stat statutes. With my lips have I declared all the judgments of thy mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as all in all riches. That verse hit me this morning. I'm like, wait a minute. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches. If I handed you all each a million dollars in cash this morning, 
how would you feel? I think you'd be pretty excited. I would be pretty excited. What does the songwriter say? I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies. I have rejoiced in God's ways, God's word, God's commandments, more as much as in all riches. Hmm. I think a lot of us would be more excited if we got a million dollars. Listen, I'd be excited if I got a million dollars. But if we want to know the heart of God, we want to understand and cleanse our way and renew our mind, we got to have a metamorphosis taking place in our minds. A different way of thinking. I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect under thy ways. We, we meditate on the word. We, you know, we spend time in it. I will delight myself in thy statutes, and I will not forget thy word. We, we need to remind ourselves. I'm at, I'm at work. Eight hours or better a day. It ain't like I, I can carry my Bible at work through my work day and sit there and, and read it and be reminded of it. No. <laughs> if I don't have it in here, I ain't going to remind myself of it. But if it's in here, I can remind myself of it. I can take the cautions of it and implement it into my, my daily life. I thought this was going to be a four-week study. This is going to be an eight-week study based on my, that clock. Hmm. Psalm 1, 1 through 3, a very familiar passage. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his, forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. You want the secret to happiness and a blessed life? Listen to what it says in Psalm 1, 1 through 3. Here's things you don't do. You don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. You don't stand with sinners. You don't sit with the scoffers. Those are the things you don't do. You don't spend your time in that. Well, what do you do? Hmm. I delight in the Word of God. Number two, I meditate. Verse 2. I think it was verse 2. Yep. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. You're not going to get it through osmosis. You know. Oh. That's not how it works. You got to read it. You got to heed it. You got to meditate on it. You got to daily meditate on his word. The Bible says day and night. That's how we cleanse our ways. That's how we lead a happy, blessed life. The, the instruction manual is there. It's clear. But yeah, we say, ah, Sunday's done. That goes on the shelf. And I'll pick it up again Sunday morning. You've now allowed strongholds walls and you will fail in your Christian life unless you meditate, you renew, you rejuvenate your mind with the word of God. The battle's up here. We have to meditate. We have to ingrain. We have to Well, I guess we'll pick it up there next week with Psalm 1, 1 through 3, and see how far we get next week. But uh, if you don't get anything from the lesson, take this away this morning from the lesson. The battle is in your mind. This is the key to victory. Spending time in the Word of God. 
meditating it. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The only way we're going to know that is to get to the mind of Christ and see what he's thinking and what his thought process is and what he has for us. And then, I mean, I, I, when I thought about this, I, I can't remember who the person was. I remember when I was a kid, maybe a teenager, somebody in the church, I can't remember who it was, the pastor would ask him to pray. And I always thought it was funny because I jokingly would say, that guy prays in King James. Like when, he, like when he would pray, he would like speak his words like King James, right? And I, when I was a kid, I used to mock that. <laughs> I used to thought it was odd, funny. Me and my friend Fred would just crack up about it, right? I view that different now. You know why that person did that? Because he was so in the word of God, it came out his mouth. That's why. It wasn't a front. He read and understood and ingrained and rejuvenated his mind so much that it came out of his mouth. And that was a lesson for me about what a foolish child I was. <laughs> but you all know that. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for this morning. Lord, I pray that we would take seriously the admonition that you have in your word, that we need to spend time understanding you and your word and ingraining it into our lives and the fabric of our life, Lord, that we might be able to have victory over our self and sinful flesh, the old man and Satan. Lord, I pray that we would think about that and that we'd commit to spending more time in your word, uh, even this week. And might we be prompted to do this through this lesson. We'll ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.